Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. And today we're looking at Onipa and Hawaii global diplomacy. Uh, what was very important is yesterday, of course, was the commemoration of the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian nation. And we saw hundreds of people marching from the Royal Mausoleum down through downtown Honolulu, ending at Iolani Palace and paying and honoring the life of Queen Liliuokalani. Uh, today, we're gonna meet with an amazing activist, advocate, translator, really a Renaissance man doing so many things, uh, conservation, uh, olelo Hawaii, and also even designing skills. It's amazing to be able to teach all of his skills today. And what we're gonna be looking at is Kanaka values for humanity's future. And we know that many people look at Onipa'a, look at Queen Liliuokalani's nonviolent commitment to challenging hegemony and the empire forces that existed at that time. But what we'll also look at is King Talakawa and what he was doing just two days later, really January 20th, but isn't commemorated as widely. I know a mahalo for joining us. Mahalo Joshua, mahalo for having me on the show. Thank you for the great things uh, you said about me, mahalo. Oh, absolutely. Uh, maybe you could share since you go deep into the language so often, what did Onipa'a stand for and why was that so important to Queen Liliopalani? Onipa'a comes from an old story of Pohaku Lekia, uh, where uh, one of the stones was said to um, Onipa'a, it says in the Mo'olelo, Onipa'a, and, and Pohaku Lekia would dig himself into the ground, deeper into the ground to, to, to be steadfast. And I think from that Mo'olelo, um, everything that Kalakaua and all of our, all of our elite before, before Kalakaua's time up until his time and, and Lilium's time, um, to be steadfast in who we are. We, I, we went to other nations and took what they had, what was working for them. How are we gonna make that into something that's very Hawaiian and something um, that was, we can stand apart from the rest of the world, but have the same values and, and at the core be very, um, true to who we are and uh, stand on our own truth. And so that's kind of Onipa'a, yeah. Exactly, and what was so amazing also when Liliu went for the nonviolent approach, it was so strong how many people signed the petitions and actually stood against. Could you maybe share a little bit about that campaign to challenge the US? Um, yeah, there was, people were angry. People, if there's anything about Hawaiians, very, passionate of what we do, yeah? And so when someone comes after the queen, um, there are a lot of people that wanted to, to take up arms, take up arms and fight back. But the beauty of that, I, I think, is, is the compassion Liliu had for her people, knowing that if we fought back in the way that they wanted to, when they was kind of provoking us to, perhaps there wouldn't be any Hawaiians today, you know? Taking up arms against the United States is not a good, <laughs> not a good ways to approaching something. And you can see her compassion and, and when she, true aloha came from that, yeah? Um, her ability to say, no, we're, we're gonna do this the right way, trusting that those bigger powers will come in and do what they're supposed to as, as diplomats and follow the rules to save her people and see no bloodshed. No one wants to see their people go through any of those things and, um, and trust in the process, you know, and, and have and believe that good and pono will always prevail. Yeah. I think that's one of the noble features is definitely she was committed to peace and nonviolence, but also rule of law and knew yeah. that Hawaii was a member of the family of nations. And yeah. looking back in history where even the United Kingdom had done a wrong and then corrected that. So it was looking to the global community and the conscience of countries to live up to their own values and morals. But of course, unfortunately, the U.S. has failed that and has issued the apology bill. What are some steps maybe after the apology bill, now that we're 29 years after that adoption of legislation that President Clinton signed into law? Um, but yeah, it was, it was signed in, the apology bill. I think, to me, I mean, that's not my strong suit, but I think it brought in a consciousness to the people that we have to be awake to, to history. And if, and if we can acknowledge our history, that's always the first step. 
And I think from then, um, a lot of our people are, are much, I wouldn't say smarter, but we know a lot more. And so that brings us into a place where we can start making moves into the future, how we want to govern ourselves, how we want to raise our community up um, <clears throat> through acknowledgement of our, of our past and our history and, and um, in, a, in ways accept it and move on. And how, how, we're, how are we going to build this time from where we, we are now? And yeah. Oh, absolutely. And of course, then with the apology, it's no longer something written in some book and people trying to find the truth. The truth is out there. And so what's so important is now that we know that it was legal overthrow, and there is a continued occupation and we go forward. It is exciting to look, though, at how forward looking the monarchs were like Kalakawa. Two days, if we look at January 20th, that should be a day that's commemorated as well, because he became then the first head of state to circumnavigate the entire globe. And his mission was so true. And, you know, when we look at his message of Ho'ulu Lahui and to raise the nation and to increase it, that was really the, the seed for that important journey. Maybe you could share a little bit about his motto and then the journey as well. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate you saying that because it shows how quick our people are to, re, to respond to something. Yeah, we see a problem. How are we going to fix it? This is what we're going to do. And so his ability to go around the globe and, you know, the first monarch to do so was, was us trying to figure out how we're going to play in that, in that arena, right? And how, kind of what I spoke on before, how do we take the good things of the world, leave some of the, the things not so important behind, and, um, and bring them back home? Um, as, as Kanaka, we always say, well, what you gonna do with that ike? How how is that gonna benefit you, your family, and the greater community and the Lahui as a whole? And so it's beautiful for him to go around into China, um, India, Japan, and and meet with all of these top level um, officials around the globe, and for them to to see Hawaii as on the same level of them that we have something, a small nation in the middle of the Pacific has something to contribute to the world. And I think aloha is the greatest thing that we can contribute to the world. And um, for him to spread that message, but mostly I think that feeling when he met with people, I think was profound. And I think we're still feeling the effects of that today, for sure. It's true. When they probably met him, and were able to see him living aloha, not just a philosophy, but actually in a practice, it definitely transformed their thoughts and understanding. And of course, as you mentioned, I mean, he went, First to San Francisco from January 20th, leaving Honolulu, but then to Japan. And when he's there, he's looking to build the friendship and that links between peoples of Asia Pacific, then going on to China, India, even Egypt. And then, yeah. of course, with the kings and queens of, of Europe. I mean, it's amazing to see his perspective. And we see some of that in some of his diaries. But it was so powerful to see in 1881 going there and saying, look, we're here and we're part of that family of nation. And this is what we can share. And I think that message of aloha, but also so many other Hawaiian words that maybe people might hear that are commodified bank commercials, but have such deeper meaning that we should all know and, and cherish. Yeah, for sure. And so maybe is there other terms that you think that people should be aware of that just should be part of our everyday vocabulary? especially building on that spirit of aloha and what he exemplified as he went around the world sharing. Um, yeah, there's, there's thousands of words we should um, we should embody every day. But I think it's not so much the amount of words, but to get deeper into a single word. And um, onipa, I think, is, is one. To, to be steadfast in what you know and your truth and, and to be versed in everything that you need to know that for, for someone to come up against you and, and they can't shake your foundation, they can't shake your kahua, oh, you win already, you know? And so I think um, now, I think onipa'a is a great word that we should all try to do like Kalakawa did. It's one thing to know a word, like you said, and, and know it as a philosophy of words on paper, but to embody it, 
to live it and for other people to understand it when they meet you, oh, that's powerful, you know? And so, aloha and onipa, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with those two for today. Um, and to be onipa in aloha, you know, to be steadfast in, in being compassionate for people, showing people care and being kind to others. Aloha just doesn't mean love, but it's all, all of those, um, those qualities that make people feel loved, you know? Yeah, only fine and aloha. I think that. That's good. That's good. That could be the new t-shirt design when we, we focus on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's so, you could see yeah. it yesterday. You could see the aloha as people marched all the way down, but also then in the commemoration. And they also commemorated the life of another amazing activist, artist, um, Hanani K. Trask. And she had a beautiful quote said, no one knows better how to care for Hawaii, our island home, than those of us who have lived here for thousands of years. And maybe that's another aspect you can share. I know you have many, you wear many hats and you have so many hats and I wanna appreciate you for the Patagonia one as well. But with all those hats you wear, can you share a little bit about conservation and what it's like to work at Pukukui and be up there? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, Haunani K. Trask was a, was a warrior and still is a warrior. Her name lives on and, and all of, her, all of her, her good works, you know? Um, and so we mahalo, mahalo her for all the time and effort and, and sitting in her space. And if there's, if there's any word that uh, embodied her, it was Onipa'a, for sure. You couldn't tell her otherwise, you know? And she knew who she was as a Hawaiian. And as a person, um, and that's beautiful. Um, yeah, so I work at Pukukui Watershed Preserve. I'm currently the manager out there. We take care of about 12,000 acres out um, on the west side, uh, Mauna Kahalawai, West Maui Mountains, um, below Pukukui, which is the summit out there on um, the highest point we have on Maui. When, we, when she said that there's no one else that knows Hawaii better than us, that can be translated to even to Aina as, um, as one of the biggest preserves um, in Hawaii, still mostly intact, I'd say over 90% intact forests. It's beautiful to see that that is all native Hawaiian plants, endemic plants sometimes, some endemic plants found nowhere else in the entire globe, sometimes not even on any other part of Maui. But to be in a space for thousands of years, you have no other choice but to have figured out how things work, <laughs> even if you try not to. We're that connected enough, um, whether we believe it or not, to understand the cycles and understand that when you are in a place for that long, you get to understand the language of that place. And, uh, and that goes with people, that goes with Hawaiians, that goes with any nation around the globe. We're not the only people on earth. And, and I always say as Hawaiians, we're also humans, that um, we're part of the bigger picture. We just have a certain way of looking, of being a human in, Ho in Hawaii. And so we have to take care of that here. And so we take an approach as best we can to take a Hawaiian approach to conservation, always looking at um, stories Kupuna left us, whether they be written, whether they're spoken, whether they're shared to us in person, um, on how, how we move in a space. It's one thing to plant a plant. It's one thing to know when to plant it, how to plant it, what we expect that plant to be. You know, um, we always say when we're planting a canoe, uh, we're planting a, a core tree, what do we want it to be? Do you want it to be a fancy watch? Do you want it to be hardwood flooring? We have to have that intent, you know? Um, and so, yeah, being in a space, it's kilo. Um, it's a term we'll hear a lot nowadays, but to, to be to observe and to actually um, take note. That way when the, the cycle, the circle and the cycle comes around again, we'll be able to, to understand it, see it and uh, make moves on it. And so she's right. Very true. I remember I was fortunate enough in end of the year to go up to the rain gate and I uh, love those 122 uh, flights of stairs. Beautiful <laughs> moment. But when you're there, just the silence, but you're really there with the gods. And you also realize how small we are, how insignificant, 
how really there's no greater purpose while we're on this planet than to take care. And so Aloha Aina. Yeah. Aloha Aina is, um, is who we are. Like I said, as because we're so small and we have such a small land base, we have to cherish it as much as we can. Um, whatever we have left, a lot has been gone, but we have to see that it benefits us in ways too. And we can't forget that. Um, yeah, being up at, at Nakalalua, up at the rain gauge, checking for um, close to 100 years now is, um, is a beautiful place to be. It's, uh, the silence is very loud. It's very loud, but um, you can't help but feel like you're in, you're in a... I always tell people that Hawaii is magic, and there's no place like it in the rest of the world. If, I mean, as far as I know. And um, to be there, you understand the complexity of, of why our kupuna thought the way they did. And that evolved a thought process, a worldview, and um, how we treat other people. You know, it, it plants are a community. It, it, I always tell people at the same time that we're like plants and plants are like us. We're the same. We move the same. You grow here, I grow here, we grow together. You know? Yeah. Definitely part of indigenous cosmology around the world. It's only yes. really that Western knowledge of thinking dominion over nature that has put us into the climate catastrophe while well, so many economic globalization challenges that we face. And I've definitely traveled around the world too. And there is no place like being there on the mountaintops and being in many places around Hawaii. And yeah. with the pandemic, many people were always like, oh, it was the worst comment I ever heard before the pandemic. Like, oh, how do you survive in Hawaii? You know, don't you get rock fever? And I'm like, it's got to be your mind is a rock if you don't appreciate all that Hawaii has to offer because it's endless and, and really limitless of all the beauty and all the places you can still enjoy. And it's always amazing anytime. If you get up to Haleakala for sunrise, if you're wherever you are, there's so much natural beauty and it does strengthen your spirit to see what matters most in life. Yeah, for sure. I always try to share people with people kind of what you're talking about. Nowadays, we, we feel like we're above Aina, where we feel we're above um, land and the environment, but really, we're not. We, we stand toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They can do things for us, and we can do things for it. Um, but realizing that we have to fit ourselves into the circle. We can't be in the middle of the circle. We can't be out of it. But we have to Jump in and just and flow with it. And, and once we get into the flow, we can, I, I, and I think we're getting there. I truly feel like um, as, a, as a global nation, we're slowly starting to get there. But there's a lot of people, right? So we got a lot of work to do. But I'll start to one, one stairs to get to Nakalalu Rain Gauge. <laughs> first step, first step. First step. And it's down the first step. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it's worse when you're coming back because it's all up. Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, I'll never forget. Uh, oh my God, he said, it's okay, Josh, you're running with the gazelles. You can be a snail. It's okay. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then I'm horrible because I see all the hapu'u ferns and I just want to hug them all because they're all so amazing in all their beautiful, evolving yeah. aspect, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Another beautiful moment I, uh, that I remember with you was Hokulea uh, commemorating the anniversary and really going up there and planting some more of the koa trees there, and that time with Nainoa and the setting up of the star compass. So I know it's the anniversary of Hokulea heading to Tahiti the first time. Can you maybe share a little bit about why it was so important to set those first pohaku and why that space there at Honolulu is so important? Yeah, um, brief history. Um, 1976, Hokulea took off on her first journey back down to Tahiti. And um, fast forward, when, when she had gone around the globe, took her three years to go around the globe, she went around, she went around, took the same path, maybe not exactly the same path, but followed Kalakaua. Yeah. And, and we did it again, you know? Hawaiians, we did it again, twice around the globe. This time without following the stars, the same way we did so thousands of years say, ago. Now we got another t-shirt, we did it again. We did it again, you know? And so um, she went around the globe, with, with the mindset of malama aina, and what does that mean, yeah? To, to take care of aina, to take care of resources, because aina is any resource that feeds you, whether that be the, the, 
the soil, whether that be the water, whether that be your parents, you know, your family, friends, community, all of that is aina. Yeah, and when we get to that point, we can see that then our, our the picture gets much bigger. Yeah, and so she went around, met thousands and hundreds and thousands of people in hundreds of countries. And, um, and Pumaykaya and I sat down one day and said, well, when she comes home, what a, what a, that same message, what, what does that mean for us back home? And, and what we do in Malama Aina, and when big things happen way back in the day, coconut groves, you know, thousands of trees were planted as commemoration. And so we thought, we sat down on a, on a, on a napkin, and we said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to plant 1,000 koa trees. Used to plant 1,000 koa trees, get, find the seeds. And then that turned into this whole Ola Oma Nui. In 2017, we had um, 1,200 Hawaiians on Honolulu Bay. I told the kids, Ra, remember this, because this hasn't happened in 100 years, and it's not going to happen in another 100 years. Remember this time. And um, yeah, we planted what was supposed to be 1,000 koa trees, turned it out to be a nearly 5,000 native plants. We did have 1,000 koa trees, but the support from co the community, uh, native nursery, um, all our farms, um, giving us donating plants, and it was just to rebuild the forest. And it was a beautiful thing. And um, yeah, half an hour, we planted a forest. It was, it was beautiful to see, and it, it was, it was, that it was a commemoration that Malama Aina is still real, yeah? And, and we have to rebuild some of these landscapes that were, that were taken away from us, you know? And how are we gonna change the mindset and there's, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. No, we have to know that there's always something we can do about it. Once we can start moving in that direction, um, we can attract the rain back. You know, uh, Hawaiian uh, kupuna would say, ha hai ka ua, ka ulu lao, that rain would follow the forest. And that was, that's what that was, to plant more trees, to bring the water down so we can catch more water and change the climate of Hawaii. Try, try to get it back as much as we can put into, and do as much as we can as, as tiny, tiny little humans. <laughs> yes. Tiny, but very positive, powerful, and passionate about the Aina, so anything's yeah. possible then. And on that day where we're commemorating, I remember Nainoa getting out of the truck and he could see how big his poetry had already gotten. And yeah. so, you know, just to see the changes from then until this last year and setting those pohaku. I remember you there with the team at Pukukui. What was that like to set that pohaku there? And what was that weekend like, that April 30th for you? Oh, that was amazing. That was um, more steps. Uh, I just feel like there's so much things happening there. It's just, there's a movement, you know, and there, there's been a movement since the 70s, but it, it's nice to know that in our time nowadays that we never let Kupuna down. And so that day we set uh, three cardinal stones. We set one in the north, the west, and the east up in Honolulu, um, in the same place that we had that commemorative planting. And so we had crew from Hokulea come over, uh, Mokiha, and we were able to set those cardinal stones in the same way that we've been sailing for thousands of years. And um, uh, Uncle Nainoa was there, and some of the apprentice uh, navigators were there. They were able to set the stones. And it was a uh, building of another classroom, and that's what Uncle Nainoa said. This is another classroom. And he saw the opportunity in Honolulu because it's one of the dark spots we still have left um, in Hawaii. There's so much light and light pollution and, and all of those things that that's one of the small place that we can still see a lot of the stars. We can look past the major ones and see all the tiny ones, but that turned into a classroom where um, another class, and keep expanding. And the more classrooms we have, the more learning we have, and the more educated people we have on the globe. And so another, an area to, to bring old knowledge into the forefront. And now it's our turn to figure out how we're going to use that to get into the future. I remember him saying, 
it was such a good joining of Hokulea because that connection with Uncle Archie and, and them talking about the understanding of the ocean of Moana Nui Akea and the oceans around the world, but then also with Pukupui saying, he goes, you speak with the trees, you speak with the land. And that's a language he says everyone's forgotten, but has not been lost with the work that you do on a daily basis. So I know that was one powerful moment as well while we we're up there planting. Yeah, I got chicken skin when you said it, you're right. And, that, and he's right. Um, I'm still learning the language, you know, and the more I learn, the more I, I, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of gratitude to the language that thank good and it, it never leave us, you know, <laughs> and, and the trees still speak it. Oh. Yeah, wow. and I, I'll never forget too, because we're getting to the end, but just the beginning, hopefully we'll have many more conversations like this. I remember that next morning after we had planted the, the trees and also the pohaku, I remember when the hokulea came around the shore that uh, you were the one to be able to actually swim into and jump into Moana Nui Akea and swim out there. What was the rest of the day like? Did you share that? I think you went by over on Molokai and share some yeah. of that experience on hokulea and what that meant for you that day. That was a blessing. Um, to be invited to go on the va'a. Um, I was actually on Hikianalia sailing alongside Hokulea. As a, we sailed back to Oahu. We went around um, the north side, Papa side of Molokai, and getting in, it was about 9, 10 o'clock at night on Oahu. But it was, it's all, I always mahalo when I get to be on the ocean because for me, that's what Kupuna first saw when they got to Hawaii. Um, we're used to, to seeing the ocean, but for them, the first thing they saw was that view from on the water and watching islands come out of the sea. And to, to see that perspective is always um, something I just, I love to death. It's true. <laughs> so it was, it, was a, it was a beautiful opportunity, yeah. Was, we mahalo you for pulling uh, Oahu out of the ocean that day <laughs> and so we could find out where we're staying. So that's good. <laughs> and so much we can continue, but mahalo Nui for all that you do on a daily basis with the Olelo, with the language, but also with the Aina and really appreciate all that you do and look forward to continuing the conversation later. Mahalo. Mahalo, Joshua.